but as much as possible, we we'll try to break uh, the issues down uh, so that uh, we can all make a good understanding of the issues at stake. And so the topic uh, for today is inflation targeting and the weak macroeconomic fundamentals. Uh, does Ghana need monetary policy redirection? Uh, we think that after a decade of implementation of inflation targeting, the time has come that we review and assess our performance, whether inflation targeting has been beneficial to this country, whether there's a need for us to rethink about inflation targeting, because even the proponents of this uh, policy, IMF and others, have said that inflation targeting is not for every country. There are some countries that do not have to go inflation targeting. And there are some countries that is suitable. So however that we see it, it is not cast in stone. We can always have alternative in implementing our monetary policy that will not only ensure macroeconomic stability, but also will be welfare enhancer. And I think that is very important. And so the outline of my presentation will just, uh, I'll crave your indulgence that I'll take you a little bit into the classroom uh, so we can just try to understand the framework. Then we'll look at Ghana's uh, monetary policy regime and then the conceptual framework of effectiveness of inflation targeting, looking at the transmission mechanism. Then we'll look at some macroeconomic impacts of inflation targeting. Then we compare ourselves with comparator countries. That is, within the inflation targeters, how has Ghana fared? So we look at the global context of inflation targeting and then review some few monetary policy alternatives that can also be available or that can be pursued uh, for a developing country like Ghana. And then we have recommendations and conclusions. So let's look at the key issues in regard to inflation targeting. As been said, inflation targeting is simply an economic policy in which the central bank either explicitly or implicitly announced a numerical target. Announced a numerical target and try as much as possible to steer the actual inflation onto that target. In a conventional wisdom, it is simply means that where the central bank try to adjust the interest rates. Now, when the central bank adjusts the interest rates, it increases costs of borrowing for both households and firms, and therefore it reduces demand. And once demand is reduced, it is able to rein in inflation. So that is the whole fundamental of inflation targeting. The central bank will always set a numerical target at the beginning of every year, and so the whole idea or the ultimate goal of that central bank will be to how to achieve that inflation target. Now, all other goals which we are going to see become subservient as far as achieving that target is concerned. So the central bank's monetary policy tools and instruments and everything will be geared towards achieving that target. And everything else, including all other goals of monetary policy, becomes secondary to the central bank. So that is the inflation targeting regime. And this inflation target has been, of course, very successful in keeping inflation levels low and avoiding many of its negative effects. We all know, and I'm going to also tell you why inflation targeting, why should central bank target inflation? Because of certain negative effects of inflation. And there's enough evidence to show that countries that have implemented inflation targeting have tend to have very low inflation levels. But many countries that have adopted inflation target are developed countries.
countries, which we will also see. Inflation targeting is transparent, very, or oh, it's a way to explain interest rate policy and to anchor consumers' expectation about the future uh, movement or inflationary levels. With inflation targeting, the central bank has a mandate to have a periodic announcement of eight economic policies or monetary policies. So it brings some transparency and accountability in managing inflation and in economic management. And so you could see that ever since we started inflation targeting, the central bank has been very transparent. In every other month, the Monetary Policy Committee announces how it is managing the economy, what are the factors that are impacting on inflation, inflation pressures, whether we are deviating from the course of achieving inflation target or not. So one of the good things of inflation targeting is about the commitment to price stability and also about the trans uh, transparency that it brings in the conduct of monetary uh, policy. On the other hand, if the rule, that is the inflation policy rule, which is a rule in monetary policy, there's always often what we call a rule and a discretion. In inflation uh, targeting, it's actually a rule. The central bank no longer has a discretion as to how it wants to manage the economy. It sets a rule and it tries to commit itself to achieving that rule. So others have argued that if this rule is strictly implemented, if it becomes very strict, it actually leaves the central bank very inflexible in its decisions making. And overly fixation on price stability can sometimes result in real economic costs to the state. In other words, I'm going to show that there is a trade-off between inflation and other goals of monetary policy, which include growth, and employment, particularly in the short term. In the long run, it has been proven that there is some consistency between inflation, lower inflation, and economic growth in the long run. But in a short term basis, there's often a trade off or inconsistencies between these two monetary policy goals. So, when it is stringently implemented or very strict, it can have very negative or consequences uh, for an economy. Now, several countries, after New Zealand adopted inflation targeting in late 1980s, we have several countries also coming in to adopt inflation targeting. And as of now, there are about 33 countries across the globe that are implementers of inflation targeting. Out of these 32, as at the time Ghana was joining, only two, one country was from Sub-Saharan Africa, and that was South Africa. And as of now, there are just about three countries that practice explicit inflation targeting. South Africa, Ghana, and Uganda, per the data that is available in IMF a database. So, 33 countries, three from Sub-Saharan Africa, and then the rest are all from industrial and most of them developed countries. Now, the functional economy or the functional autonomy of the Bank of Ghana in adopting inflation targeting is guaranteed under the Banking Act, Act 2002. And this was actually the beginning of the regime where the Act was promulgated to try to guarantee some functional autonomy and independence, which is a prerequisite for effectiveness of inflation targeting for the, money, uh, the central bank. But not until 2007 that the country officially began to implement inflation targeting, 2007. And so since we officially started, it's just about 10 years that we've done that. 
Prior to the adoption, as the chairman alluded to, we used to have a monetary aggregate regime that is immediately before the inflation targeting, where the central bank target the monetary growth by how much is money growing. The conventional notion was that money and prices are highly correlated. And therefore, if you are able to control the quantity of money in the system, you'll be able to also control inflation. But over a longer period of time, it realized that the correlation between inflation and monetary growth was very weak. And therefore, there was the need to shift away to an alternative monetary policy. And that is how come we landed on inflation target uh, policy. So, what is the goal of monetary policy? The central bank, what are its goals? What is it that it has to do in a nation? Now, the central bank conducts the nation's monetary policy, which means that it adjusts the quantity of money. And that's the principal goal of the, uh, the central bank, to adjust the quantity of money in the system with the ultimate goal of ensuring low and stable prices. That is the goal. But there are other equally so important... Can I interrupt just a yes, please. Um, can the owner of this, or driver of this vehicle, be a passenger to the vehicle right away? GC3860. The central bank principally have five key goals. The first one is the price stability goal. The second one is the economic growth goal. The third one is the full employment goal. That means ensuring that people get jobs to do. The fourth one is the exchange rate stability through ensuring equilibrium, equilibrium in the balance of payments. And then the fifth one is interest rate and financial market stability. These are the goals of monetary policy. Now, the price stability goal is to ensure that prices are low and stable. Now, the issue has always been at what level do we say prices are stable or low? In fact, the reason why, even as of now, there's no standard definition for inflation targeting is because of the very nature that has been implemented. Because whereas some countries believe that price stability, a low stable price is 2%, others think that is 8%. Others think that is 12%, depending on the country's tolerance level to inflation. Some countries, because of the, the negative relationship between inflation and economic growth, there are, when your inflation levels are increasing, there are thresholds beyond which it has a negative relationship with economic growth. So what is important for any country is for that country to identify the optimal inflation rate that is consistent to its growth. And so, therefore, the stable and low prices is not uniform for every country. It depends on what level is consistent. And so, for some countries, it's a low inflation economies, naturally. For some other countries, it's high inflation economies. And therefore, if America is targeting inflation target at 4%, Ghana perhaps cannot say that we are also targeting it at 4%, because the, the economic structure is completely different in that respect. So what is important for inflation target is to know that optimal level, that threshold spectrum that is consistent with the economic growth. Now, in one of the standard um, uh, written by Alan Grispan, a former chairman of Federal Reserve of uh, US, uh, he said he tried to define what inflation uh, stable and low price is uh, in the context of America. And he said that in the more practical terms, inflation or low and stable inflation is the percentage change in inflation that is too small are insufficient to materially affect households or firms in their decision-making daily. 
and that is for them that is what can be said to be uh, stable prices. So that level can be four, can be two. Of course, no country in stricter terms has set inflation target at zero because of the tendency for it to slip into deflation, which is even more serious uh, nature. So these are the goals of uh, monetary policy. The other thing is that these goals, the central bank cannot achieve all of them at, at once because particularly the fair free goals have a consist inconsistent relationship. They are trade-off. You cannot achieve price stability and at the same time achieve economic growth particularly in the short term. And at the same time, I, 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 I achieve full employment. However, you can achieve price stability alongside exchange rate and then interest rate uh, stability. So let's look at the transmission mechanism. How does it transmit itself? And this is the whole, the hallmark of inflation targeting really is through this transmission mechanism. This is how it transmits. Now the goal, in this case, the central bank decides that the main goal, the ultimate goal is not growth, it is not employment, it is not exchange rate stability, which in the past other countries and so many other countries use as their ultimate goal. In this case, the central bank decides to use price as the ultimate goal, which in the literature is known as the hierarchical mandate of the central bank. The central bank can also have two goals. That two goals is known as the dual mandate of the central bank. It can decide to combine both price stability and exchange rate stability or full employment and price stability depending upon the goal or the national agenda, what the nation intends to achieve. Now, so at the beginning of the year, the central bank will set a numerical target. Let's say 8% in the case of Ghana. And then this target, in many countries, is a point target, that is one time target, point, or it is a band, or a range. So that instead of just saying 8%, it will set an upper limit, and then a lower limit. That is the range. And many countries, as uh, Chile, Israel, and others, often have a range target, instead of a point target, because it also, give some flexibility to the central bank when we set a rich target. But often ours is a point with a deviation where we set eight plus or negative two. Now, so when that is set, then the central bank uses interest at the monetary policy rate, which is also known as the official cash rate, as its own monetary policy tool. Now, this tool the intention is that is to, ad, to be adjusted to affect wholesale interest rates and then it affects interest rates. Now, so if the central bank manipulates this, there are three channels through which this can affect the economy or inflation. We call it the interest rate channel, the expectations channel, and then the exchange rate channel. In recent literature, we have also added the price at the asset price channel. But I will just limit myself to these three channels. So we have the interest rate channel. Now, the cent this is the rate at which the central bank is prepared to lend overnight to banks or to borrow from banks overnight. And the intention is that it would affect the whole so interest rate, that is the interbank rates and then the treasury bill rates and others, and then that will in turn affect the retail rates. The retail rates are the lending rates. So when the central bank have the feeling, believe that there is inflationary pressures, which means that inflation is to deviate from the cost of 8%. Now the central bank will raise the monetary policy rates. Now the intention is that when the monetary policy rate is raised, the bank's wholesale rate will also rise. And that will affect the, in, the retail rate, lending rates. The lending rate will rise, and the rise will lending rate, which is also the cost of borrowing, will reduce expenditures. So firms will no longer be able to borrow to invest. Households will no longer be able to borrow to consume. 
And the two together will reduce what we call the aggregate demand in the economy. So demand will reduce in the economy. And because demand reduces, like all things being because those who have done supply and demand, demand reduces means that price will what? Will reduce with a given what? Supply. All right? So price will reduce, and then the average uh, price levels would fall. The other thing is, if it's not through this channel, it can go through expectations, which is one of the fundamentals of the transmission mechanism. It's crucial for the effectiveness of monetary policy. Now, we often hear that the monetary policy rate is a nominal anchor to anchor people's sort of expectations about inflation. Now, when the central bank raises the monetary policy rate, the whole idea, you and I will know that the only reason is for what? Inflation to fall. So it anchors people's expectations about a lower inflation. Like all the way we know anchor in the ship. The anchor are in the ship to hold a ship from going what? Astray. And so the central bank do not want people's expectations to be higher than its target. So it uses the monetary policy rate to anchor our expectations so that people's expectation will be that inflation will be 8%. That helps if with banks to price their future interest rates. It helps workers, labor, to uh, negotiate their wage with using what, 8%. If labor does not think that inflation will be 8%, in their negotiation, they will not use 8%. They will use 10% or 15%. And in the end, the central bank will not be able to achieve the 8% because the cost of wage and other input will be what, higher. And so it, the actual inflation will be about 15%. So it is important that the central bank uses this tool to, to, to uncost expectation. The third one is the exchange rate. Now, sometimes the exchange rate also has a pass-through effect on inflation. When your currency depreciates, particularly when it depends so much on imported products, and it depreciates. It passes on to consumables, and that put pressure on inflation upward. So when currency depreciates, the central bank realizes that and adjusts the monetary policy rate. In order to hear the shock will be what we call portfolio shock. So in order to increase the returns on domestic assets, Okay, so once returns on domestic assets increase, then instead of people buying the dollar, they would rather invest in, let's say, treasure bills or bonds and others. By so doing, they strengthen or we strengthen what the, uh, the currency. And so once the currency is strengthened, it becomes relatively stable and inflation target will be achieved. But there's a flip side. So this is a transmission mechanism. This is how it moves to impact inflation. Some countries can have this transmission mechanism in about six months, depending upon the lax and the variability. Other countries, it can be one year. Other countries, it can be two years. It depends upon the efficiency in the relationship and then the, 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 the market efficiencies, the uh, co uh, consumer response, the private sector response, the bank response, and all the others. But the flip side is that while interest rates increase, it increases the cost of borrowing. And so it leads to lower investment. Now, that lower investment will mean that there's going to be what? Low what? Production in the economy. And the low production means that what? Low assets. Which then goes to strengthen your currency. A stronger currency makes your export uncompetitive. If your currency becomes strong, you will not be able to export as much as you want to export, and that could also reduce your aggregate demand and reduce your economic growth. So this is the transmission mechanism that a country has. Now, sometimes I will talk about some of the policy responses where, in some cases, it has been erroneous. There have been wrong policy responses to some of these shocks to the economy. All right. So let's look at the preconditions for effective inflation targeting framework. Inflation targeting, as I said initially, is not for every country. There are some preconditions that countries must meet before it becomes successful 
and it becomes effective. So one is institutional independence. The central bank must have full legal autonomy, particularly from the fiscal dominance. One of the problems that we have had is fiscal dominance. It is until 2016 when the, the law was uh, changed, when we passed the law in 2016. Otherwise, we have had very serious fiscal dominance where the central bank purchases government bonds and negates the effect of mopping up or stringent or tighter monetary policy. Okay, so you could see that in some years, the central bank financing of the budget could go as much as 30%. And that was a negative effect on inflation because of the gov government domination of the central bank. So one of the preconditions is for the central bank to be strong and to be completely independent from the fiscal. Otherwise, inflation targeting will be difficult to be achieved. Well-developed analytical capabilities and infrastructure. When the chairman was talking, he talked about the issues with data. Where you do not have a functional macroeconomic framework with very reliable data, it makes your forecasting of inflation difficult. And many developing countries have this problem. Difficulty in getting reliable, timely, complete data has been the biggest issue for inflation targeters. And if you don't have a policy framework, it's also difficult for you to do that and the capability to do that. The economic structure, inflation targeting requires that prices are fully deregulated and the economy is not overly sensitive to commodity prices. And I like that portion. The economy is not overly sensitive to commodity prices. Because if your economy is overly sensitive to uh, commodity prices, you will always be responding to the shocks in the commodity prices than responding to the domestic economy. And that could lead to high gulf in your monetary policy rate and then your inflation rate. So if an economy like ours, which is highly primary commodity dependent and whose prices fluctuate very widely, then of course, per this precondition, inflation targeting might not be good for us as a country. And then also healthy system, financial system. Your financial system, domestic financial system, banking system, capital market must be very well developed. The banks must be very well capitalized. They might be able to respond swiftly to central bank policies. If that is not there, if the banks are not well developed, inflation targeting perhaps might not be for you. For all the reasons that we've been having with capitalization of the banks and the challenges and the inefficient financial market system and very shallow capital markets, perhaps this may also be another issue. All right, for, so, for somehow, uh, I mentioned about the fact that inflation is very important for any country to making sure that no matter what, you, however you want to manage your economy, you must always ensure that your inflation levels are low. Because studies have shown that high levels of inflation can result in inefficiency and low economic growth particularly in the long run. But in the other areas, you can see that high inflation can result in what we call the menu cost. Inefficiencies in, the, uh, um, in, in, in firms' pricing, where firms of, uh, have, uh, are expected to constantly change their prices because of high levels of inflation. That can lead to high costs and uh, some inconveniences. Shoe leather costs, which also we known as tax on one's money. Where inflation is very high, when you hold on to money, you are taxed because the value of that money reduces. And therefore, you are often compelled to put your money in interest and in assets. And you have to be doing back and forth uh, in order to get uh, money to spend. And that can affect the 
the, the, uh, the inflation or money serving as a medium of exchange or as payment. And then it may create inflationary spiral that leads to hyperinflation. And that's what any country does not like. To have a hyperinflation can throw, distort the entire economy. So no country really wants to have a high a spiral inflation. And then uncertainty. Inflation can also cause uncertainty in the uh, investment market where the market cannot plan or cannot foretell what prices will be, they will delay their investment. And that can also infect economic growth. So these are some of the advantages. The reason why inflation is always a prime target for central bank. But there are also arguments against inflation targeting in that regard. Where some argue that the cost of inflation targeting exceeds the benefits, particularly in developing countries, that the cost exceeds the benefits. In the where there's low growth, high unemployment, weak productive structures, volatile exchange rates, the cost is often higher than the benefits. During, if the rule is implemented very strictly, an inflation target could severely limit the central bank's flexibility in responding to changing economic conditions and could have costs, economic costs, real economic costs to the country. All right. Now, let, let's, I, I try to survey the literature a bit, just not to, I mean, to put the economy, uh, the, uh, the, what I'm saying, in the proper context. So there are several wealth of literature around what, uh, so I, I I'll just try to uh, look at some of them. Now, these are popular writings as far as monetary policy is concerned. And I'll try, with my daughter, so I'll try to read it for you. Yeah. So, while the brain inflation targeting highlighted extensive evidence, this is by Bentec and others, 1999, the Bentec years. While favoring inflation targeting um, highlighted inflation, is extensive evidence that the framework success created of national output, that is sacrifice ratio, compared to non target that in many targets, there is a success trade with national output in achieving inflation target. Michigan and others say that inflation targeting will only be successful and not sacrifice economic growth if and only if standard initial conditions of central bank operational independence, absence of fiscal and financial dominance, and moderately low inflation are in place. Stiglitz, our own Stiglitz, said that debased inflation targeted as a crude recipe for developing nations as long as they do not integrate themselves of the international shock by restructuring their economic fundamentals. And Michigan 2010, an important criticism of inflation targeting is that a sole focus on inflation may lead to monetary policy that is too tight when inflation is above target, thus may lead to output fluctuations, lower economic growth, and high unemployment. So these are known, very known economics in the framework. So now let's assess some performance. So I look at this at, since we started inflation targeting, and the red line is the 2007. The green lines are the projected inflation. And then, the, so we have the pre and post inflation target. And the red line is the actual, the outturn of inflation. And then the green line is the monetary policy rate. Three out of 10 after, seven out of 10 after we implemented inflation target, the target have been missed. And you can see that uh, those, these are the targets and these are the, 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 the actuals. And it's only three out of 10 where we've been able to come close to missing the target. It's not too much of a problem missing the target, but sometimes it can lead to reputational and credibility costs, damage to the central bank. And the central bank can fall easily in time inconsistency problems, uh, and that can weaken its ability to affect inflation target. So, I also look at, since we started inflation targeting, and I've made an argument that 
because of the weakness in our economic structures and the fact that the economy is so sensitive to the commodity market, over a period of time, the gap between inflation and monetary policy rate has widened. And because the monetary policy rate is the interest rate below which the commercial banks cannot price their loans, interest rates have also remained very high. So let me just keep, so you see that when inflation in 2010, around 2010, the monetary policy rate was around 13.5%, around 2010, and inflation was quite close to around 15 thereabout. Now, at more than a year from October 2015 to March, uh, January 2016, uh, January 2017, the inflation, the monetary policy rate remained at 26%. This was happening when inflation was trending downward. Now, why didn't monetary policy rate reduce in tandem with a lower inflation follow? was merely because the fundamentals at the time was very weak. The city was depreciating very weakly. So although the monetary policy, the inflation was reducing, the pressures on inflation to rise was high. So the central bank dare not reduce the monetary policy rate. So you see this graph. In around 2000, this is 2007 when they started inflation targeting. Now, the red lines are inflation, monthly inflation, and the green lines are monetary policy rate. The purple line is the gap between monetary policy rate and inflation. It's the gap. Now, let's look at this gap. In around 2007, the gap was almost negative. Negative 2.4. Then in 2013, the gap was 2.2. That is the gap between the monetary policy rate and inflation rate. In 2016, the gap increased to 4.2%. This is something that is supposed to influence inflation. But because of the weakness, because even if inflation was falling, the economy is said that there's constant pressure on inflation to rise. Because your, your productive structures are very weak. Your economy is overly sensitive to exchange rate and the commodity prices. So there's clear between in the two. And that is the problem. So you will see that the, this, this commercial bank base rate, that's the purple one, this is the inflation. And this is the lending rate. Now, the lending rate has remained higher because the lending rate cannot fall below the monetary policy rate. So, so long as the monetary policy rate, that the base rate, is high, the lending rate will remain high. Even if we discount the other operation, uh, the other uh, determinant of the lending rate, the monetary policy rate is a benchmark rate. So until the monetary policy rate falls, the lending rates will not fall. Okay. So now, so what is the knock-on effect to all this? You will clearly see that ever since the inflation targets in 2007, and I want to state this, with the exception of 2008, where we recorded economic growth of 8.1. Since then, if not for oil, if not for oil. Economic growth has been flat. That is non-GDP, non-oil growth. Non-oil growth is the red one. The blue one is the oil growth, economic growth. So the non-oil growth has not averaged 4.5% over the period. Recently, when we increased to 7.8, it's purely due to oil. When Growth of 40% was purely due to oil. 
an economy that is that has to grow on the average by seven to eight percent, you cannot afford it. And this then will stifle your work, your capacity to generate work, employment. You may have achieved a lower inflation, but the ripple effect is that lending rate is so high, I didn't show that graph, and you, sh you will see that the growth in lending rates, the growth in travel sector credit, has fallen from 45% to about 13.5% over the period. And it's clear. All because we cannot just put our monetary policy down because the pressures, the underlying pressures is so high that we will deviate from the cost of the inflation pattern. Now, let's compare ourselves to other inflation targets. Sorry, this table is very low. It's very small, so you can't see. In fact, Ghana has the weakest macroeconomic fundamental among all the inflation, inflation targets in countries. The weakest. In terms of average, the average monetary policy, we are the highest of around 17, that is between the period of 2003 and 2016, which I took the average. And this includes all the countries, the 33 countries. So we look at their monetary policy rate, we look at their inflation rate, we look at their uh, trade balance, we look at their fiscal balance, all these countries. We look at the exchange rate, the rate of the exchange rate depreciation, and Ghana is the worst in terms of form. The red lines here is the rate at which our currency has depreciated. The blue line here is inflation targets for Africa. That is the blue line, um, uh, uh, South Africa and Uganda. And then the other green line is the rest of the world. And if I show you this graph, this is the inflation the vertical line is inflation, the horizontal line is monetary policy rates. Um, for all the inflation target countries, Ghana's rates is not even comparable to any one of them, even to the rest of Africa countries. 17, this is where even inflation was then 15.5 at the end of the year 2016. And the average monetary policy rate was 17.5. And it was one of the highest, it was the highest in, that, in around all these countries. So we also tried to do some correlation analysis, which I'm not going so much. And we found out that in fact, the inflation tax, the monetary policy rate, it's observed that positive rate change is greater than negative change. That when the rate is positive, when the adjustment is positive, the response of other interest rates was much greater than when the, it falls. When it falls, the response of other interest rates was much less. That showed the insensitivity of the other interest rates to even the monetary policy rates. Okay. So, what is the question that we're asking? Should the country explore alternative monetary policy under this situation? Is there even alternative monetary policy for Ghana? The literature suggests an alternative monetary policy framework, if the preconditions are severely lacking, if the preconditions are severely lacking, the literature is very clear that there is no point for a country to move. And in fact, reading from an IMF paper, for instance, an IMF paper points out that despite the flexibility of the inflation target framework, there are countries where institutional and operational capacity and structural characteristics are likely to make inflation targeted unsuitable as a monetary policy framework. Unsuitable, given the preconditions. So an alternative policy target should be consistent with and support the nation's priorities. That is policy that would ensure stable prices and at the same time enhance economic growth and generate enough employment. It is key. So there are two key alternative policies that I'll just start on and I'll end. And these in the literature are what we call the real exchange rate targets. The real exchange rate target, particularly where the country has very weak productive structures, and if commodity or if exchange rate is uh, very, uh, should I say, vulnerable 
to external commodity shops. The best policy option has been to target a stable and competitive rare exchange rate. Now, in many countries, they have what we call the dual mandate or the multiple target rule of the central bank. The central bank combines two targets depending upon the economic structure. In our economy where the exchange rate has always been the biggest problem as far as macroeconomic stability is concerned because of the high pass-through of the exchange, the depreciation to inflation. Some have suggested that perhaps we should have a dual mandate where the central bank targets to the real, a stable and competitive real exchange rate and inflation target because of course there's no way you can do away with inflation. You have to make sure you and there are several countries, countries like Chile, Hungary, Israel, Singapore, Poland, combined inflation and real exchange rate target. And they have been very highly successful in doing this. Having the target, they have a target bank in that respect. The other policy alternative is also given the fact that even for the country, the Ghana is looking at how to have a high and stable growth and generate enough employment. The policy goal will be to target real output, which we call real targeting approach. In a situation where inflation target has generated significant cost, slow growth, sluggish employment generation, and high real interest rate, as has been found in Ghana, the literature proposes a real targeting approach. In this approach, the central banks are giving a country appropriate target. So that the, the central bank is giving a target of, say, let's grow the economy by, say, 8%. Or let's make sure that employment is about 10% in a given year. In that case, subject to a constraint, where the constraint is inflation. So you have an inflation constraint. But the ultimate target will be achieving certain level of growth because you want to generate a certain level of employment. So you mash out all your monetary policy tools and introduce new ones to even making sure that you achieve that goal. If you have to direct credit to certain areas that will be employment enhancing or output enhancing, you will do so. If you have to give incentive to certain firms and others, the central bank aim at the end of the day is to achieve certain growth target because of the nature of the economy. So there are alternative policies that can be followed. Inflation targeting is not cast in stone. There are always alternative. So in conclusion, I say that the paper is not in principle against the adoption of inflation targeting. It is to make a point that further intervention seems necessary to augment its effectiveness. And while changing the inflation targeting involves risk and can run into important transitional difficulties, we must give sufficient consideration to the fact that we need to rethink how to best combine stable prices, stable and low prices, and growth.